This is the story all about how my life got flipped, turned upside down. And I want to explore what it means to now be a management consultant, having all my life thought that I wanted to be a physicist. And given that I am a consultant and the reputation we have, if you don't want to hear this talk, the doors are over there. The next lot of people will be on in 20 minutes, so do feel free to come back then. Oh good, everyone stayed. Excellent. <laughs> So my friend Charlie told me that we are all a sum of the best stories that we have to tell. And these are the stories that I can share with you at 1 p.m. on a Saturday afternoon. If you want more, there'll be time later in the bar. And I want to talk about three types of topics. Um, I want to talk about resonance across these topics because I'm a management consultant. We all think in threes. And because I used to be a computer science, we also count at zero. So it's actually four. as King's Cross has shown. So what happened? How did I start from a child aged, I don't know how young, but dressed very pinkly, at the Cavendish Laboratory and now in management consulting? Well, my parents were pretty atypical for Chinese immigrant families. Um, my dad sat me down when I was 11 and told me, I don't really mind what you do with your life. You can." bin all this and actually be just a rubbish disposal person and not go to university and I would still be proud of you no matter what you did. And this, to my Asian mind, was incredibly terrifying and had to be remedied with some parental pressure of my own. So I decided that since my parents were both doctors in the physical science, I had to also pursue a doctorate and this was definitely a most logical decision. So I went to university I studied maths because I'm a good Chinese daughter and that's what good Chinese daughters do. <laughs> and I realized that logically it would make a lot of sense for me to go and study something which required lasers and large equipment because I can sing, I can dance, I can read books on my own time, but I need someone else to fund my equipment. So this led me down to the root of my PhD where I ended up with an electron microscope which cost more money than I hope to make in this world and probably larger than any piece of equipment that I would ever want to work with again. And I realized on a dark, dark night in a very dark, dark lab, about two years into my DPhil or my PhD, that this was not really what resonated with me. This is not what actually I emotionally felt was a good fit for me. And up till now, all this very, very precise Excel optimization had not really worked out. I had enjoyed my time studying maths. I had loved finding out about the beauties of physics, but it's not really where my passion lay because I kind of wanted to see more people and fewer microscopes. So with this knowledge and at a time when a relationship which also didn't resonate with me was failing, I decided that I had to solve this problem in the most direct and assertive way I knew how, which was to read every self-help book that I could find, including some philosophy from very crusty old men. And I realized that this is not something that you can beat into submission with just more knowledge. I came across a particularly interesting phrase from a guy called Erich Fromm, who said that man's main purpose in life is to give birth to himself, which to me sounded biologically quite impossible. Um, but then I realized that what he actually meant was that through our journey, we should always seek to personally develop. And it is through that personal development that we actually professionally develop. So let me take you back to what this meant. At high school, at high school, the first time I heard the word resonance was when I saw this picture. My physics teacher told me about mechanical resonance and stuck up this picture of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. Who in this room has heard of that? Please raise your hands. Excellent. Keep your hands raised if you realize that this has absolutely nothing to do with resonance and is actually aer aeronautical flutter. Ah, excellent. Engineers in the back or people who've read Google, as I did this morning and realized I should probably bin this section of my talk. <laughs> but this led me to think a bit about breaking and what causes structures like these, which seem so beautiful and so good and perfect, to break down. And this led me to think about my experience at the end of my PhD, where I realized it really wasn't the right fit for me, it wasn't the right resonance. And I realized, having also read some articles 
by Sheryl Sandberg and Adam Grant recently that you may have seen, where we talk about burnout. And a very shocking statistic says that of a thousand people in the workplace, 80 more women than men burn out. 80 more women than men. And it got me thinking, well, why is this? What is going on? And I realized that all of us are driven. We're all incredibly talented. You here have such exciting opportunities ahead of you and such exciting careers. And it is so beholden on us to take advantage of that. But we also need to be mindful and thoughtful about how many of these responsibilities we take on. And at the time, I had just too many, and too many that didn't really resonate with me. And so what had actually happened was that I hadn't really listened to my body, I hadn't really listened to myself and thought, is this really right for me? And as I said in my first job interview at McKinsey, when I realized that the interviewer was falling asleep, you have to really listen to your body. You need to really, really understand how it feels if you want to dance well. He immediately woke up, which was good. He was also quite shocked, which was quite bad. And so I had to explain myself and try and explain what I meant by this. And um, what I mean is something which occurred to me over the last two years of working as a consultant, which is part of our passion and part of our energy also contributes to our own sense of insecurity. Because when we feel like we have so much to offer, when we feel like there is so much to do, it is difficult to prioritize how you go about doing that. And when you don't have a grounded and very mature sense of what you have to offer, it is very difficult to try and do everything. And in those situations, we burn out. The article by Sheryl Sandberg mentions that women are more likely in the workplace to do the little things, to care, to feed the pot plant, to take the biscuits, to make sure that the rooms are tidy. And those are things that are taking up energy. But we need to prioritize where we spend our time and energy. And to understand where our limits are, we really need to listen to our body. Which sounds really, really yoga-like. I feel like I should be in downward facing dog here or something. <laughs> <laughs> so when I joined McKinsey, I was not grounded. I was incredibly excitable. I had no idea where I wanted to focus. And this was such an exciting opportunity to me to explore the world and to find out how I can be useful in it. And I joined as a business analyst, which after a PhD was a little bit of a step down because I expected to also be joining my fellow PhD students as a junior associate. But what I realized what this was that this was such a blessing because it gave me the room and the time to really ground myself and to understand and to develop gravitas. So this is a word that I want to talk a little bit about because people keep telling me that the barrier for women in business is gravitas. And I don't even know what that word meant at the beginning of my time. So gravitas to me is a resonance with what you believe and how you value yourself so that you feel like you can push back and say no, choicefully, not out of fear, but because you have decided that this is your boundary and that you don't wish to take this opportunity to stretch more than that. And in doing so, we can push back against all these pressures and insecurities that we feel that we have to work 100 hours a week because we have no other way of comparing ourselves to our peers other than the number of hours we work or the number of projects we take on. So what does this mean in practicality? I'm always told that I need more gravitas when people talk to me about looking young. And because I'm Asian, I will look pretty much like this until I hit menopause, <laughs> apparently. And then I'm gonna look like that, which is quite exciting, I tell you. <laughs> I'm not quite sure what's going on there, but I think the age 120 is a good thing, right? So <laughs> what does this mean if I want to be taken seriously in a world of work where my clients are 50 years old, where the people I want to influence are much, much more experienced than I am, and who probably have some very unconscious biases about what I can do as a person with little experience and looking quite young. It means that I really have to believe what I say, and to have that resonance with my own voice, to believe that what I have is valuable. 
And to do that, I had to fall from this excited state into a kind of more grounded state. If you're a physicist, I really hope you know what I'm talking about. Where I can project that gravitas because I no longer have to be running around everywhere trying to do everything. So back to why I ended up in McKinsey. Partially, I think unconsciously, I realized that during my PhD, this was not an area where I could develop. I didn't have opportunity to really understand what it took to develop that gravitas. And luckily, I ended up in McKinsey, where I have, I hope, tried to develop a bit more of that. So with those new skills of believing in yourself more and realizing you don't have to pursue everything, how do you get the most out of your career? Well, let's go back to what I was originally really passionate about, which was lasers, not in the sense of a rave. Uh, it's been quite a while since I've been to one. <laughs> but in the sense of what you can do with them in a physics lab. And I was in Oxford, um, where I was also at a TEDx event. And a wonderful talk, which really resonated with me, was given by Merritt Moore. And she talked about lasers and optical cavities as the interaction that you have between an audience and yourself and as a ballerina and also a physicist how that really helps her to connect with her performance and with her audience and it kind of got me thinking a little bit about how you can apply this to your career and to think a little bit about what it is that makes a career successful and it made me realize that lasers are pretty much like what you need to do to get ahead and Apologies for the uh, very kind of square image. This was the only one that Wikipedia would allow me to use, which had a Creative Commons copyright. So what do I mean by that? What I mean is that this journey that we're on in our careers is not one that you undertake alone. When I was doing my PhD, it was an incredibly individual task. I felt like the entire burden of the PhD was on me to deliver. and. I didn't seek enough advice and outside counsel and collaboration with others. And that is to my detriment. I think I would have had a much more fun time if I actually talked to people. So when you think about a laser and the beauty of the optical cavity is that if you place the, the mirrors at the right distance apart, then you create this resonance between them, which allows stimulated emission to actually exist. And if you think about that as an analogy to your career, you are one of the mirrors. And the people that you interact with, the mentors and the sponsors that you choose to work with, are the other mirrors. So finding the right fit for you, the right people who inspire you, who are motivating for you, who make you laugh and you think are pretty cool, are more important than how successful they are or how attractive. So. Women often get told that we need both mentors and sponsors, and I've just mentioned those words. And I want to think a little bit critically about the difference between the two. Because a mentor is someone that we kind of understand as an advisor, someone who is experienced and older who will help us and develop us in our career. And they are key to our personal development. I came across the word sponsor when I was um, a year into McKinsey and realized that everyone was talking about it and I had no idea what it meant. I thought we were going on some sort of charity run and I had to go around collecting money. And I realized that actually a sponsor is different. A sponsor is someone who is not just going to help you in your career, but who is going to open the doors for you by giving you opportunities where you stretch yourself. By believing that you can do something completely crazy that you never thought you could do, like running your own client study when you're five months into McKinsey, or like reaching out to a CEO when you are six months in and have never actually learned anything about logis logistics up till that point. But the key to finding these people is not by banging on their door and saying, would you like to be my sponsor? I'm really keen. It's about this excitation energy. You have to give something to this relationship to build it. And it doesn't have to be as mercenary as saying, I'm going to be your dog's body, please be my sponsor. It is much more a genuine relationship between you and someone that inspires you, where you are both mutually excited about working together 
and about helping each other achieve their goals. So the last thing I want to talk about in relation to a laser is the idea that the gain medium is very, very important. That is where the power is going to be for any excitation to actually emit. So what is the gain medium in terms of the work environment? The work environment needs to be something where you feel like it really matches you. I chose McKinsey because honestly, I met the people and I thought they were pretty cool and they were my kind of people, which I'm not sure what that says about me or McKinsey, but I'm hoping it says good things. There are many, many companies out there. There are many, many opportunities. There are many, many things that you could do, but the environment in which you place yourself is going to have such an important influence on how much you enjoy yourself, how much you develop. And that is a choice that you should do mindfully. McKinsey may be a great consulting firm, but it might not be the right fit for everyone. I made a choice consciously when I chose consulting that I wanted to see more of the world, that I wanted to meet as many people as possible. I wanted to try and learn as much as possible in terms of career development in as short a time as possible. And I was willing to trade off the fact that I was probably going to work a little bit harder. Although, in retrospect, I think I actually worked harder in my PhD. So, there is one more thought I want to share with you. These are some of my McKinsey, uh, McKinsey colleagues. It turns out that they look excellent in sequin jackets and also <laughs> waving um, bottles around near waterfalls. So I wanted to share one more thought with you. This is a photo of when I was very, very young. I challenge you to try and identify which of the two is me. In my PhD, I thought a lot about Fourier transforms. What has that got to do with this photo? Well, if we think back to the time when I told you I was a good Chinese daughter and I should do maths, I also realized that my parents only could have one child and so that I was to them both a daughter and a son. And when I was five and I came to the UK for the first time, my mum sent me off to school with two words in my vocabulary in English, toilet and drink, which is very useful to get you through the day, but not so useful when you have to tell the teachers that you are not in fact a boy and that you are in fact going to want to play also with the girls over there in the other corner. At the time I had short hair and as you see on the right, pretty similar to the guy on the left. So what has this got to do with Fourier transforms, I repeat? When I was stuck in the lab on those dark, dark nights, I realized that if you think about a Fourier transform, there is always a minus k and a plus k in phase space. And it led me to think about complementarity and the fact that there is always both a masculine and a feminine. There are men and women in the workplace. And having grown up in a girls' school environment. This was slightly new to me at university and even stranger to me at the world of work. And it led me to think that actually we are both masculine and feminine in our personality traits. I recall a really interesting TED talk by Amy Cuddy where she recommended that we adopt power poses, um, specifically ones of the other gender to try and flex the way that we could be more powerful in the workplace. So I thought this was great. I immediately took this advice, being the action-oriented person that I am, and went into work the next day with a power pose, sitting there, very confident. Fortunately, I did not realize that I was wearing a skirt and this was not a good idea. <laughs> so the other passion that I have is ballroom dancing, which is quite an archaic thing to do. And this is me trying to dance. And I recall a comment about Ginger Rogers, who is described as doing everything that Fred Astaire did in the 30s, but backwards and in high heels. Thankfully, dancing has moved on slightly since then, and there is now more fake tan. And also, crucially, women also go forwards, which is quite exciting. And it was in one of these dance uh, practices with my very demanding Eastern European partner, Tadas, where I realized that I was doing exactly the same as he was. That I was moving forwards while he was moving backwards in exactly the same motions. 
And thankfully, this made the practice much more smooth afterwards. But it also made me realize that in work, in life, we have both characteristics. We can go forwards and backwards as men and women, but always as ourselves. Obviously, having to come up with some sort of uh, evidence base around any of this, I checked Google and I thought a little bit about what it means to have masculine and feminine personality traits. Um, Thomas Murray, aka the Wikipedia source on this, says that traditional feminine traits include modesty, humility, sacrifice, supportiveness, empathy, and sensitivity. And he describes masculine traits as courage, strong will, ambition, assertiveness, initiative, and rationality. I can already hear the feminists decrying this as completely wrong. But what I'm trying to say to you is that these things should not be a mass, uh, personality traits unique unto men or to women, and that we are a blend of both. And I'm particularly inspired by some of the work that bodies such as the 30% Club are working on to really identify what it means to actually have women on the boards of large companies, women in leadership positions. As a woman with ambitions, this is excellent news to me. And they have done significant research to show that women on boards actually increase the earnings before tax and in before income, uh, interest and tax by 55% compared to companies that don't. So there is a real financial benefit to this. If you're thinking about doing a startup, think about appointing a woman. Unfortunately, the landscape as it is today is one where there is not gender parity. And this means that we only have five female CEOs on the FTSE 100 company boards. And only 23.5% of boards are women. Hopefully this number will go up with a lot of you sitting in the audience today. And I really hope to see a world where there is more gender equality. But I don't mean just in terms of the people who sit on the boards, but also in terms of our behaviours when we, when we exhibit them, as both masculine and feminine. Especially in this particularly hyper-connected world that we live in, where things move so fast, where data is exchanged and interrogated to answer questions, where the speed of work means that sometimes we are asynchronously connected to each other. A lot of the typically feminine traits are incredibly necessary for us to connect, to understand, and to actually answer the right questions. Emma Watson said in her UN speech that we should strive to work together on this. And towards the end, she said something really powerful to me. She said that it is both for women and men that we do this, because it is man's right to also be part of their families, to raise their children, to cry if they want to, because frankly, guys, it's an excellent and very efficient way of reducing your cortisol levels under stress. And I deeply encourage you guys to work together, to talk to each other, to listen, because this is not a women's issue. This is about how we can live in a connected digital world together better with empathy and with connect connectedness. So I think I'm probably due up on time. And as you may have realized, this was a 80-20 approach to a TED talk. So if you do want to hear more of the stories, which are not suitable for 1 p.m. on a Saturday, please do join me later for a drink. Thank you.